Now, I'm going to bring a message tonight, you're going to be turning to Genesis chapter 2, that I have preached here before. As a matter of fact, the first time I preached this was, oh, let's see, we'd been in this building for a year or two, and then the last time that I preached it here was in 2011. The reason I'm doing it again, because it really fits for right now, and it has to do with rules. Now, I titled the message back then, Why I Hate the Rules. I never planned on preaching it again anyplace else. But it's amazing. At a lot of places that I have preached in the last few years, uh, matter of fact, I've got quite a list of churches that I have preached it in, and I don't know what that number is right there, but that seems to be one of their favorite ones. I, I preached the message up in Brogue, Pennsylvania, at Mount Zion Baptist Church, where Brother Starr was the pastor, and... Um, and I had some people come up to me afterwards. They said, uh, they said, did you preach that at your people? Did you use the same illustrations? And I said, yes. He said, didn't anybody get mad? And I said, I didn't care. <laughs> and that, that, that was the truth. Uh, but especially at Christian schools, this is one that if people get it, it, by the way, this message will help you in every part of life. If you will get and understand this message tonight, I don't care what age you are. If you're a third grader, if you're a third grader and got it now, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache in life. There are a lot of adults still haven't gotten this. But if you can get it, it will help you. You'll be more content. You'll be happier. And if you're happier, you'll be healthier. You will enjoy life a whole lot better if you get this message. Now, we're going to be talking about rules and obeying rules. And you say, well, you know, there are some people who think that we're breaking a rule in meeting together tonight. And why would you do that? Let me tell you something. I know the Bible says that we're to obey every ordinance of man. But you understand that is as long as the ordinance of man does not cause us to disobey the word of God. The word of God comes first. You remember Daniel, when he was told he couldn't pray, he went home and prayed. And he prayed openly where everybody could see it. Didn't hide from it. He prayed. Now, for that, he got thrown into the den of lions. And again, he was a hero not because he came out of the den of lions alive, but because he was willing to go in. So when they command us to do something that we cannot, uh, something that would cause us to disobey God, then we have to tell them, no, we've got to obey God rather than man. Now, I believe that we're not really disobeying anything, but for those who think that we are, uh, listen, that's okay, we're going to obey God. When we stopped having these services, by the way, and I'll explain this, and just went live stream, they were not commanding us not to have church. It was a suggestion that we not do it, and we felt for the safety of all of our people at that time. After all, we didn't know much much about the uh, COVID virus at that time, And you listen to all the different doctors. Obviously, we still don't know a whole lot about it now. And uh, they tell us one thing one day and something else another day. And uh, the doctors disagree with one another. So with all that having been said, uh, you look at all the new numbers that are out there about this thing. And you're finding out that we can't trust the numbers that are being given by our own government uh, about how it's hit here. Any more than we can trust the Chinese for what they had to say. So what we have to do is it's time to get back to meeting together, especially when there are government officials who think that they have the authority to tell the church of Jesus Christ not to meet. That's a problem. And if you give in to that, then you're willing to give up just about, you're willing to give up the First Amendment to the Constitution. You're willing to give up everything in the Word of God. It's kind of hard to stand for anything after that. So understand, there are times we have to disobey men, when the rule of man would make us disobey God. Then we disobey men. Now, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. It says, And the Lord God put the man, or took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give me clarity of thought tonight and clarity of speech and help us to understand some things about rules tonight, the necessity of rules. 
and why it is important that we learn something about obedience and not just be a people of rebellion as the flesh wants to be. So Lord, teach us tonight. We could save somebody from a lifetime of heartache and trouble if they just get the truth of this message. So Lord, have your way in our lives and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Now the truth is, I'm sick to death of the rules. I hate rules. I'm so tired of rules. And I've heard people tell me over and over again, you just can't have any fun because of all the rules. The rules just keep us from enjoying life. Now, there are many who think like that. There are many who think that, all right, the world's got rules, but we shouldn't have any rules in the church. Come on now. That's, not, that's somebody who's totally stopped thinking. But if it's true that you can't enjoy life with all these rules, I want you to think about this for a moment. Every sport that's out there has rules. And why do we participate in sports? Because it's fun. We enjoy it. And yet they all have rules. In basketball, they have rules. And they put at least three men out there on the court in striped shirts to make sure that you obey the rules. And they don't give you any leeway. If you're going down the sideline and you get close to the, the out-of-bounds line and you got the ball, and if just the very edge of your sneaker hits that line, they blow a whistle, they point you out in front of everybody in the gymnasium and in front of everybody that's on TV, and they say, you're out-of-bounds, your team loses possession. If you foul somebody, they point you out, they give your number. They put it on the screen. They make sure everybody knows that you fouled Somebody, you've got to obey the rules or you can't play the game. You say, I don't like that rule. Well, you either go by it or you don't play the game. And the problem is there are a whole lot of people out there that they like, they want the rules to apply to everybody else. They want the rules to apply to the other team. But every referee ought to understand the niceness, uh, the niceness of my heart. I would never openly disobey, therefore I ought to be given a little bit of a break. The rules are for everyone but me. In football, it's that way. As a matter of fact, in football, they don't put three men out on the court, on the field. They put at least six men out on the field. And they have a couple of other officials that are sitting back up in the booth watching things to see what's going on. They make sure everyone obeys the rules. It's that way in baseball. It's that way in soccer. Uh, do you realize there's a sport called toe wrestling? They're actually professional toe wrestlers. Now, you've got to have some long toes, I think, to do this. I mean, I don't see how a short-toed person is going to make it in toe wrestling. But there are rules for toe wrestling. There are rules for arm wrestling. It's not just a matter of doing whatever you want. I mean, they have officials right there to make sure that you obey the rules. You realize there are rules to marbles? As simple as that is, there are rules. Now, I learned this a few years ago. There's, there's, I never would have thought this would have been a league, but there is a first Lego league. People play Legos, and evidently they play it competitively. And in their website, there's even part of the site that is stated the first Lego League rules. You would think if there was anything there wouldn't be rules to, it'd be Legos. But no, there are rules even when you're going to be involved in that league. I don't care what toy store you go to. In toy stores, you find all kinds of games. And do you realize in every box of those games, there is a list of rules for that game? Why do we play games? To have fun. And yet they got rules in the games. Now, obviously, some of us have never read the rules. We play like somebody played that we played with, but they don't, you know, there's rules to Scrabble. There really is. And uh, Bago and all those kind of things. There are rules. Do you realize that rules actually define the game? You change the rules, you change the game. It's just different. There are rules. Are you getting to where you like rules? Every country has rules. Every, every state has rules. Every province has rules. Every city has rules. Every town has rules. Every village has rules. Uh, listen, every entity that there is has rules. When the car was invented, they had to come up with a whole new list of rules. And as the car has gotten more sophisticated and more technical, they've got even more rules. Whole sets of rules. You realize without rules, the bullies win. Governments 
have rules. Every government has rules. You have, if you have an income, do you realize the government has rules about your income? You can't just get your income from any place. You can't go out and sell crack cocaine. You may make good money, you may make a good living like that, but you do that, you're probably gonna find yourself in prison because you're breaking the rules. You can't earn money that way. Do you realize even if you earn money legally and do it all right, the government says it deserves to have part of it. And you don't decide what part of it they get, they decide what part of your money that you earned that you get. Do you own property and you paid for it? You say, listen, this is my property. I've paid a fortune for it, it is mine. You think it's yours. Stop paying your taxes, find out how long you have it. Because the truth is you're leasing your property from your government. You understand that? Those are the rules. And by the way, it's that way in every country that I know of. Every business has rules. Do you, can, can you imagine this? They even have rules about dress. If you, go, if you go get a job down here at Chick-fil-A, you cannot wear a McDonald's outfit and work at Chick-fil-A. You've got to wear a Chick-fil-A outfit. If, if you work at McDonald's, you can't wear a Burger King suit. Bunch of cultists down there, Jim Joneses, what do they think they are telling us what we can wear, what we can't wear? You want to work at one of those places, you better go by those rules or you won't have a job. It's just, a, God forbid that the church would say anything about dress. When there's right dress, proper dress, and improper dress. I mean, surely, all you church people are interested in is dress. Wait a second. What about McDonald's? Why don't you say that about them? I got to wear a certain thing? I guarantee you, nurses have got certain things you've got to dress when you work down there at the hospital. Yeah, I ought to have free. No, you can't. They got to have rules about that. And by the way, rightly so, they have to have rules about it. Do you realize there are even rules for war? Now, whether or not you suffer from anything in the war, a lot depends on whether or not you're on the winning side. But nevertheless, there are even rules for war. Isn't it interesting that even in the Garden of Eden, when God put man in the garden, and according to the scripture, it appears that the first rule that God gave... He only gave to Adam. And it appears, because Eve isn't created yet, no doubt she learned of the rule from Adam. And I have a feeling that Adam said, I can't positively prove this, but I have a feeling that when Eve came along, that he told her, we cannot eat of the tree of the, garden, or, or, the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or we'll die. As a matter of fact, our family rule is, we're not even going to touch it. Because she threw that extra part in when she's talking to the devil. I think Adam was simply trying to protect his wife and protect himself. If you don't touch it, you don't eat it. And people find fault with Eve about that. I don't. I think that would have been a good rule. Okay? But nevertheless, you'll notice here in the passage, God gave them one command. He said, you can eat of every tree of the, of the garden except one tree. That's it. The day you do, you die. One rule... And they couldn't keep that. One rule. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't life be so simple if you only had one rule? Wouldn't that make everything easy if we just had Adam and Eve had one rule? And they didn't keep one rule. And if you're sick of the rules, get mad at Adam and Eve. It's their fault. Say, preacher, why do you hate the rules? Let me give you a number of reasons. Number one, because people are going to break them. I don't care what the rule is. Every rule there is, people break. Now, I know what someone may be thinking. Someone may be thinking right now, well, I, if I break any rules, it's only the small ones. It's, I don't break the big rules. Oh, you're a liar. You've broken the biggest rule that there is. Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 22, what's the great commandment? And his answer was, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and everyone has broken that. And you've not just broken it once, you've broken it thousands of times in your life. You can't think a bad thought, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
You can't say a foul word loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You understand? You've broken it. You say, well, but most of the time I do. All right, let's take another rule. Thou shalt not kill. What, what do we call a person that kills? What do we call them? A murderer. Now, does that mean thou shalt not kill that you're just not supposed to kill most of the time? I mean, are you okay if you just kill once in a while? No. You've broken God's command. Thou shalt not kill. Well, what about the greatest commandment of God? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, with all thy mind. We've all broken the greatest commandment of God. We are great sinners. We deserve hell. You see, if a man broke man's greatest rule, he deserves the greatest punishment man could give. But if a man breaks God's greatest rule, he deserves the greatest punishment that God could give. We deserve to go to hell. Now, thank God he has saved us. For those of us who've taken Christ as Savior, he's given us eternal life. But that does not change what we deserve. We deserve hell. Thank God I don't have to worry about going there because he has saved me. Amen. So you understand, people are going to break the rules. I don't care what they are. Jeremiah 4.22, the scripture says, For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. It's amazing how hard people work to disobey. People go out of their way to do wrong, no matter the rule. Now, when we moved into this building in 2003, we had some people mention that they would like to have a night where they played basketball. And so we set Friday night aside for them to play basketball. Well, now we've got to have some rules. Ah, how's this rule? This is a good rule. Uh, we weren't going to charge them anything. I mean, we weren't going to charge them for... Uh, we weren't going to charge them for the electricity. Running those halogen lights that we had back then were very expensive. We didn't charge them for that. In those lights, there was another light bulb that was emergency lighting. Now, to turn on the halogen lights, all we did was go to the wall and flick the switch. But then, for those of you who've been here a while, you'll remember that we had these sliders on the wall. These sliders worked the emergency lights. And now, those lights ate up the electricity. You, you think the halogen lights ate up electricity. Those lights really ate it up. And so we told them, don't use the emergency lights. And so they'd play basketball on Friday night. I'd come in on Saturday morning and the emergency lights had been on all night long. All night long. That didn't happen just once. We told people, we even put a sign on the wall. Don't use the emergency lights. As a matter of fact, we even put a a cage around the emergency sliders. And so what they would do is they would, like they couldn't see. We're letting them play basketball in our gym. We're paying for the utilities. And then they would take a pin or a pen or something and they would reach inside the little cage and push the emergency lights up. And so finally we said, no basketball. Oh, that's not fair. What are you doing? Well, you can't keep a simple little rule. We're letting you play. What's your problem? And we had to have another rule. The other rule had to do with air conditioning. Now, you're playing. You ought to be willing to sweat. Don't need to turn the air conditioning down to 60 degrees to play basketball. As a matter of fact, you can turn it up a little bit so you can sweat. Sweating's good for you. So I'd come in on Saturday morning, and it'd be freezing cold in there. No basketball next Friday night. We tell folks, listen, you need water? We got water fountains out here. It's how many steps from the gym to the water fountain? I mean, you're needing the exercise anyway, right? And they can walk all the way in the kitchen and they can get the styrofoam cups, which was not for them. The kitchen was not theirs. The cups were not theirs. They'd fill them up with water, take them into the gym to use, and then they would leave them there for Betty to pick up the next day. And so I'd have to say, next Friday night, no basketball. Listen, and I'm the bad guy. You understand? I'm the bad guy. Because people can't keep a simple rule. They think like, well, that'd be for everybody else. That's not for me. And I don't know of anybody that ever paid us for those cups, by the way. 
I don't know anybody that ever paid the extra utility bill. And when they finally broke the emergency lights, I don't know anybody that ever paid for that. But I'm the bad guy because I stopped them from playing. You see, I don't care what the rule is. And I know in our academy, we have a lot of rules that I could write a name after. When we first started our academy, I think our student handbook was maybe four pages long. Now what is it, 20 pages long? 25 pages long? Because people can't keep simple rules. When we built this building, I absolutely hate, I detest speed bumps. I hate them. I doubt there's anybody in this auditorium that hates speed bumps more than I do. And uh, we, had, we had people in leadership say, you know, we need to put speed bumps in. I said, no, no, we'll just tell people. After all, we're dealing with Christians here. We'll just tell people, drive slow. You come up here, n surely none of our people, none of our saved people, none of them, want to hit some child running out in between a car and killing them and having to live with that the rest of their life, that they killed a uh, brother or sister's child. Because nobody here can stop as fast as what you think you can stop. Nobody. And so, soon, soon, I'd make an announcement. I'd make an announcement again. I'd make an announcement again. Enough. Speed bumps. Now, because I hate speed bumps, we put little speed bumps in. We didn't put big ones in. We put little speed bumps in. Those were those yellow things that were out there. And uh, that cost us a little bit of money, which nobody ever pays back for. Like all you people who sped, you never end up giving us money to put speed bumps in to slow you down. I don't know why that is. And you made us do it. So then we put in bigger speed bumps. You see, the problem with the small speed bumps was this. It worked for a little while until people found out if they drove over them fast, they didn't feel it as much as if they drove over them slow. And I've said, I've said this all over the country. Finally, for me, let's put in tear out your muffler speed bumps. <laughs> Who wants to kill the child? Because you're just so stupid, you can't wait an extra five seconds to get to your parking place. It's ridiculous. I hate rules because whatever rule you have, people are going to break. And not just one or two. And not just your worst people, good people. Good faithful church members will break a rule that ought to seem obvious to any thinking person. Here's another reason I hate rules. You might want to write it down. Rules make people angry. And the thing is, you see, they get angry at the rule giver. Let me show you. Turn over to Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, it says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now, there's no doubt that God had taught Adam and Eve the importance of the blood sacrifice when he slew the animals to cover them with the coats of skins. There's no doubt about that. Because God, according to what was done here, God expected both Cain and Abel to know which sacrifice to bring. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. God didn't accept it. And we got a New Testament verse for that. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God's word is truth. I don't care how much you worship God. You don't worship according to the truth. Then you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping yourself. Amen. It is an offering that is not acceptable to the Lord. Now, so God asked Cain, why are you wroth? If you do well, you'll be accepted. Just do right. Just do right. That shouldn't be that hard. That ought to be easy. But he gets mad at God. God was the rule giver in this, in this case, and he's mad at God. I'm thinking of the verse, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? But that's not all he's mad at. They also make people angry at the rule teacher. Now, in this case, in the case of Cain, it would be the Lord as well. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you take Micaiah and Zechariah. 
Micaiah was a man, remember what Ahab said? I hate him. He never says anything good about me. Why? Well, Ahab lived contrary to God's word. And Zechariah was the last of the prophets to be murdered in the Old Testament. Why? Because he preached God's word. Jeremiah constantly thrown in jail. Why? Because he was simply teaching the people of God the word of God, and they didn't like that. They didn't want it. So rules make people mad at the rule giver and at the rule teacher, and they also make people mad at the rule enforcer. Now, in this particular case, God would be the enforcer of it, but we see that in life. Who gets booed the most in any ball game? The referee or the umpire. Kill the umpire, you know. We hate the umpire. I'll be honest with you. You go to other countries, of course, usually their sport is soccer. I would never be a soccer referee. Those people are despised and hated. They make a call that goes against the home team. They may not live out the rest of the day. That's serious stuff. They're mad. The referee didn't make the rules. They're just enforcing the rules. People get mad at cops all the time because that cop gave them a ticket. How fast were you going? I was going 55. What was the speed limit? 40. And you hate the cop. Why? Should have been out there catching real criminals. Well, what's a criminal? Isn't that somebody that breaks the law? What does that make you? Why are you mad at the cop? He wasn't speeding unless he was trying to catch you. You made the cop speed. He ought to be mad at you. I mean, just think about it for a moment. People get mad at police all the time simply because they are the rule enforcer. Do you really want to live in a place with no police? Do you really think you'd be safe with no police? And by the way, in churches, they get mad at preachers. They get mad at preachers because although we're not the rule giver, we are the rule teacher and we're the rule enforcer. We want to keep the church in line with God's word. And you take those mealy mouthed milk toast preachers that give in to everything and let their people be as worldly as what they can be. Listen, they are a scourge upon this entire land. It's worse than the COVID virus. Matter of fact, may have even brought it on. Who knows? So I hate rules because it makes people angry. Number two, or number three, rules show us for what we are. Turn over to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And notice beginning in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law, now get this, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good was then that which is good and made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I can send unto the law that it's good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. You see, the law, and I don't care what the law is. I don't care if we're talking about a speed limit law. We're talking about God's law or whatever. But the law simply shows us for what we are. You know, I know how we could, we could empty every prison in America. And we started doing that with the COVID virus. And boy, we're going to be paying the price for that one right there. What absolute stupidity. 
I mean, we, we got politicians that do not have a brain in their head. They have been so brainwashed, they have washed it out completely. But I'll tell you how we could empty every jail, every prison in America, and that is to do away with all the rules. Do away with all the laws. There's no more thou shalt not steal. If you want to steal, you can steal. If you want to drive by a playground and throw a bunch of drugs out in the playground, you can do it. That's okay. There's not going to be, there's not going to be any crime in that. If you want to try to get a bunch of kids drunk, that's okay. If you want to commit all kinds of, of violence and, hey, that's all right. Nobody goes to jail. Everybody's free. Now, do you want to live in that society? Matter of fact, more than likely, you're probably going to be killed in that society. Because there are all kinds of people who want the freedom to do anything that they want. The rules show us up for what we are. Number four, it appears they only encourage people to do wrong. Now, I already said earlier that, you know, no matter what rule you have, people are going to break them. But let's take the speed limit for a moment and let's do a history lesson. Some of you are old enough. Now, you young people, you don't get this. I mean, you haven't been around long enough. But back in the late 70s, which isn't that long ago to a lot of us adults, but back in the late 70s, Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States. We had a gas shortage caused by our own politicians, but that's another matter. We had a gas shortage. And in order to save gas, they cut the speed limit no higher than 55 in every state of the union no higher than 55. If you wanted to drive on 565, 55. You wanted to drive on 65, 55. You wanted to drive on 75, 55. Nobody could drive faster than 55 without the fear of getting a ticket. When that went down to 55, people were driving 60 and 65. Because we all know, Brother Weaver, that you can go 10 miles over the speed limit and cops aren't going to stop you. We all know that. I mean, you surely learned that in Canada school, didn't you? No, you didn't. Oh, my goodness. Matter of fact, we found out that um, they've, they've totally, totally done away with quotas. They can raise as many tickets as they want now. Anyway, that's, that's another matter. A little, little humor there. You can laugh. That's okay. But then Reagan became president. And Reagan took the speed limit back up to 70. And in some places out west, even higher than that but took it up to 70. Well, you'd think now, people have been driving 60 and 65, everybody's happy. Now, everybody's going to obey the speed limit. Nobody's going to drive higher than 70. I mean, boy, what a blessing that is. And guess what? They drove 75 and 80. Unless you lived around Atlanta, then they drove 90 and 95. Only in Los Angeles were they still driving 25 on the interstate because there were too many people, too many cars, and they couldn't go any faster. All right. But the point is this, no matter what the speed limit is, we are so wicked, we're going to break it. Well, I think that's ridiculous for it to only be 45 miles an hour over there on, on County Line Road. All right, get elected and change it. You think you got a better idea? Uh, I've seen places where I think, why on earth is this so slow here? You've seen it too. And so I'm going to be my own, I'm going to be my own sovereign citizen. I, I don't know who came up with that term, but that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I'm a sovereign citizen. Break the law and find out how sovereign you are. I guarantee you, 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 go, you go down to Mexico, you go someplace, some other country, and you don't obey their laws, you're going to find out you're not sovereign. Whatever country you're in, you're under the laws of that country. That's just reality. Get a grip. Grow up. All right? The point, the point is this. It seems like they only encourage, encourage us to do wrong. For instance, you can tell them there's six billion stars in the heavens. They'll believe it. No problem with it. Okay. But you set a chair outside, and you put a sign on it that says, Don't touch wet paint. There'll be fingerprints all over that thing. I mean, people go up and touch. Even though it says, don't touch, went paint. It was painted for a reason, so it'd be nice. They got to go over and touch it anyway. It's like any rule just encourages people to break it. Are you learning something about rules? 
But don't miss this next point. It's vital. Rules re reflect the values of the one in power. I get this. Rules reflect the values of the one in power. Do you realize that tonight in Canada, from what I've been told, you cannot preach outside the church building on the street. You cannot preach against homosexuality. You'll be put in jail. That reflects their values. Let me give you something even more stark. If you live in a place that's under Muslim law, Sharia law, if a woman is raped, doesn't make a difference who it's by, then she gets the death sentence. Not the rape. The rapist doesn't get the death sentence. The woman gets the death sentence. By the government. Because that's their value system. Please understand that all rules reflect the values of the ones in power. Why was Nazi Germany such a horrific, horrendous place under Adolf Hitler? Because of his values. And his Gestapo and all that reflected his values. Mao Zedong, when the communists moved into China, 40 million communists were, or 40 million Chinese were killed under communism. That simply shows the values of the communist government. We got people today wanting to be socialists. Move down to Venezuela, see how much you like it. See how much you like living under their values. They make the rules. Values reflect the values of the people in power. The scripture says this, Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Number six, and I basically touched on this already, but it deserves a special thing. Rules are reflective of the depravity of man. It makes no good, it makes no matter how good you're trying to be or how how much sense it makes that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, for instance, we've, I already mentioned the, the speed bumps. Uh, we had a cry room. We have a cry room now back here. I, I never seem to learn my lessons. Uh, the reason for the cry room is it's not for sick people, and it's not for people to sit in during the service and carry on a conversation. We have a short list of rules in the cry room. I don't know. There might be nine or ten rules in the cry room. It's basically for parents, the child's, you know, a little antsy uh, and you don't want the child to disrupt in the service. And for some reason, they don't want to take them to the nursery. It's for the parent to go in there and sit and take care of the child. And they still can see the service. We have a screen up there. We have, um, we have the, the sound comes through in there, all of that. And it's very, very plain. It's not a place for talking. It's a place where you can sit with your child and still get the service without bothering the people. It's amazing how many people, they go in there, and man, they never even look at the screen. They sit there and talk with the other people in there. Sometimes it's gotten so loud out there in the hallway from the cry room that people in the security room have had to go in and say, you've got to quiet down. And yet it's right there in black and white. And we did the cry room to be a blessing. And good people, I'm talking about church members now, good people make it a curse. Isn't that a shame? It reflects their depravity. In the nursery, we've got a nursery, we have to have rules. Guess what? You change the child, you've got to have gloves on. The, uh, the, cookies, the cookie container, all that stuff just can't be left on the floor. You've, you've got certain things that you need to do to take care of the kids. When, when we moved into this building, and this is a much bigger nursery, uh, we got three rooms back there, and they're very, very nice. We spent a lot of money to put that back there. Um, we had people quit the nursery because they didn't think it was any fun having nursery with all those rules they had to keep. Well, wasn't that, it's not that big of a list, really, but it was important. Well, people who can't keep rules like that have no business being in the nursery. We had one rule that men could not be in the baby nursery at all because of nursing mothers. 
And I remember we had one man who went back there about three times. I, somebody finally came and told me, and I went to him. I said, the next time you go back in that room, we're going to have all of our ushers go back there, and they're going to throw you out of that room. You're not going in there anymore. Now, for some reason, that guy hates me today. I don't know why, but, but and yet he's the one who did wrong. The rules reflect the depravity of man. No matter how good the rule, someone won't like it, they'll break it, and they'll be mad at the rule giver, the rule teacher, and the rule enforcer. But again, number seven, without rules, bullies rule. Without rules, bullies rule. You get a bunch of guys playing basketball, you say, we're not going to call fouls and stuff like that. Uh, the bullies are the ones going to run everything. Some of you ladies have played volleyball with guys playing volleyball. And you know that the, the gals know the rules. The guys don't. All they know is, ah, whoa. That's all guys know. They know how to play their position. They know how to play everybody else's position. And the gals have to spend most of their time trying to get out of that jerk's way. Some of the young athletes aren't caring for this right now. And some of you ladies just go ahead and say amen, that's okay. <laughs> but without rules, bullies rule. Nebuchadnezzar, why did he put those three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? He is a bully, he was in control. Okay. Number eight, it is impossible to enforce the rules uniformly in the eyes of everybody. And I'm going to repeat that again because that's hard for you to write it down that quick. I know, but if you'll write it down and get this, it is impossible to enforce the rules uniformly in the eyes of everybody. In the book of Ezekiel, four times, as a matter of fact, I'll, we'll turn to one of them, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 25, it says the same thing in three other places in the book of Ezekiel. But Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 25, and this is one of the problems that God had with the children of Israel at this particular time. It says, yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal and are not your ways unequal? Boy, just watch a bunch of guys playing on a basketball court, you know, all the time. Uh, it's funny. They can knock somebody into the wall, and uh, they don't think that they hardly touched them, and no foul should be called on them. And the other person just touches them, and they're screaming. Why didn't you call a foul? I've seen it in school. Some child does wrong. And by the way, we can only, in school, for instance, enforce rules when we catch kids doing wrong. So we catch a kid doing wrong. And the parents, they come, they're mad at us because their little darling told them that a bunch of other kids did it too and they didn't get whipped, only their darling got whipped. Well, they should have been happy with us because their child got helped and the other kids are going to do it again now because they didn't get help. But we can only do the ones we catch, not the ones that the other kids are saying, well, that one did it too and that one did it too. Well, when we catch them, we'll get them too. But parents don't think, man, they're so naive about their own children. They believe everything their children say about what every other child in the school does. Don't believe anything that the teachers tell them that their child does. Teachers, you can say amen right there too, and I know you'll be glad. The problem with rules is us. It's our sin. That's the problem with rules. And I'll tell you what, I hate rules because the buck stops here. When people get mad at any rules that we have here, and they'll say something like this, well, they said we can't do it that way. I know who they're talking about. They're talking about me. And the thing is, they know who they're talking about. Just say it. Just Well, Brother Allison said, don't give that funny stuff what they said. Grow up. I can handle it. I can take it. And when you say, well, Brother Allison said, I'm going to add three more rules to that one. Amen. There you go. You say, what are your basis for the rules? Well, some things are right and wrong, and we're going to do right, and we're going to outlaw the wrong, number one. Number two, we have found over the years that some things work and some things don't work, and we're going to do what works. 
Now, we're not talking about we're not talking about rules that are necessarily right and wrong, but we're going to do things that work. The third part about rules is this. In some cases, somebody has to draw the line someplace. And none of us are going to agree on where the exact line may be, but somebody has to draw the line someplace. It was just like when we paved our parking lot out there and we put parking spaces in it and we had the lines drawn. Well, you just can't draw them any place. Somebody has to say, right here. And once you paint it, man, it's right there. And that's just the way it is. When you start saying, for instance, uh, how short is short when it comes to dresses? Well, I believe it ought to be down below their knee at least. And if it's farther, that's okay too. Anything above that, I believe, is totally wrong. It's the bearing of the thigh, by the way, that God calls nakedness in the book of Isaiah. Now, if somebody says, well, I think we ought to have it down to the ankles. Well, when you become pastor, you make it down to the ankles. That's fine. But I'll tell you where I'm going to draw the line. I'm going to draw it where it's safe. I'm not going to draw the line right on the edge of sin. I'm going to draw the line where it's safe. And you'd think every one of God's people ought to want it that way. You don't want your children walking on the line all their life. You need to teach them some things about rules. Now, I've given you all that. God has a rule about who goes to heaven. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Guess what? God's not compromising for anybody. But he could get so many more to heaven if he just compromised on that. No, he's not going to get any more to either you come his way or not at all. You don't get to go your way. You have to go his way. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's God's rule. You can't get to the Father but through Jesus Christ. So when Bailey Smith, several years ago, was president of the Southern Baptist Convention, made the statement that God doesn't hear the prayer of the Jews, and boy, did he, he took a pounding from even Southern Baptists. Since the Jews had not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that was his point. He was simply telling the truth. He was giving it right. Every Baptist should have said, Amen! We know what the Scripture says. The one prayer God wants to hear from a lost person is that prayer of turning to Him. That's the first one I'll hear. Other than that, no, they can pray all they want. They're just blowing smoke into the air. But God's rule is salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Now, going through this message on rules, what does that show you to be? Number one, if you're not saved, you need to come to Jesus and be born again. You need to trust Christ as Savior. And for anybody that's watching over the internet, I want you to know that you can call us right now. We'll have some men from staff out there who'd, who'd be glad, on the phone, who'd be glad to tell you how you can have Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you can receive that free gift of eternal life. The number is 256-830-6224. It's 256-830-6224. We'd love for you to come to Jesus so that you can go to heaven when you die. Now, for believers, I, I'll tell you what. I hate this. I hate having to rope off a pew and hate having to rope off another pew. I hate you having to sit at least six feet apart. I hate it that you can't shake hands with one another. I hate that. I hate it that we can't have a nursery back there. I, I, there's a lot of things that I hate about that, but you know, if we rope off some of these pews, that doesn't violate my faith. It's just something to help make you be safer. And that ought to be fine with everybody. But you roped off the pew that I always sit in. Come on. You realize how childish that sounds? Really? When I think of believers who were tortured for Jesus, and you got to have my pew. First of all, you don't own any of these pews. All right. But don't get me into that now. But if you find that one of the things that you struggle with, things are so miserable, you don't like everybody else's rules. Well, how about growing up now today and understanding that says something about you? So, I, there's a lot of things I'd like to change. All right, then why don't you, for instance, when it comes to the government, run for office? And when you become 
a representative, senator, president, they'll still find out you can't do a whole lot about it. Oh, okay. But the Bible says the problem is in the heart. Right here. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. God, give us a surrendered heart. There can be so much more peace in each of our lives. If we just understood these truths about rules, they're not there to hurt us. They're there to help us. And the ones that we are not to obey are the ones that would cause us to violate our faith if we did obey. Now, Lord, do a work in our hearts, I pray tonight, for I ask it in Jesus' name.